Could I invite Greg up to the stage? And while he does that, I'll just uh, give you a little bit on Greg's background. And he's going to give us some perspectives on reinventing for a sustainable value. Following an extensive career taking New Zealand's brands to the world stage, including Icebreaker and Michael Hill Jewellery, Greg joined Brenworth as CEO in July 2021. The company had just made the bold move to ditch synthetic carpets in favour of 100% natural, biodegradable, renewable and high-performing wool. This caught Greg's eye because as a father of five, he is passionate about doing what he can to help leave the planet in a better position for future generations and being part of companies that are authentically transforming to be better. There are a lot of parallels in the journey Brimworth has been going through to rebrand and leverage of the sustainability of wool, which has lots of parallels of our red meat sector. And I look forward to hearing Greg's reflections. Welcome, Greg. Well, g'day. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I was walking here this morning uh, from my hotel, which is, I don't know, 800 metres away, and I couldn't help but think, you know, how a disaster has transformed this city into something pretty special over the last decade. And it sort of it reminded me of the, the issues that, you know, are being faced across the globe in, in, various, um, in various ways. I mean, we're we have an economic crisis, we have a social crisis, there's a health crisis, and in France last week there was a mustard crisis, uh, which is very important to the French, I'm told. But um, look, I, uh, I'm honoured to be speaking here today um, and to share with you some uh, stories that I've had as a result of a career where I've been lucky enough to work with uh, founders of organisations that were prepared to challenge the norm um, that were prepared to uh, rise above and change industries forever, and in fact, in Jeremy's case, you know, created create a, a whole new category. Um, look, the other part I noticed, I mean, I arrived in a green cab yesterday. I got to my room. Uh, it was called a green cab. Anyhow, I'm not sure. I think it was the electric car. Um, I, I got to the, the room, and there was a... Uh, a little um, card which says I'm going green and it related to um, not getting your room um, serviced. Uh, I went into the bathroom and there was a bunch of products which um, were in really speaking to their environmental credentials. Um, there was a packet of chips which I was very interested in at 10pm for some reason uh, which um, were made from, well, which were contained um, by a compostable bag. And I thought to myself, gosh, it's just everywhere, isn't it? You know? um, and in fact, regardless of where you sit, um, it, it's pretty cool. And you know, as mentioned by George at the start, I, uh, I, I was lucky enough to work for um, Icebreaker for nine years. Um, and it was a company that was you know, really focused on that. And in fact, my first job at Icebreaker as the CEO was to sell the company. Um, which was quite daunting, really, to get the CEO's job and realise that within three months, if you were successful, you probably didn't have one. Um, but that's OK. Um, but what I can tell you is the, the reason that Icebreaker was, was, able, was so you know, valued by um, the company that are in, in the end purchased it was because of its transparency. It was because of its sustainability credentials. It was because of the purpose and the reason that that brand existed. It's because it was different. It stood out from all the other brands that that, um, that company owned. And that company was VF Corporation, a three, uh, $30 billion US company. It owns the North Face, Vans, Timberland, Dickies, and so on. And so, you know, for Icebreaker to um, be sold for $300 million to that business, the number one reason they bought us was because we were a purpose-led organisation that was transparent and that was adding value to a natural, renewable resource in Merino wool. So then you look at Michael Hill, uh, and, and just to rewind the clock back, um, and some looking around, some of you are, are around the same age as me, um, and, and others are a lot younger, but you know, Michael Hill 
started uh, uh, when he was 40 years old. So when you talk about reinventing, it's never too late. He started in an industry that was absolutely stodgy and uh, old fashioned. And, and for those of you, as I said, who are around my age, if you walked into a jewelry store back then, it normally had a little bell on the door and there was somebody who looked down their glasses at you and decided whether or not they thought you could afford to buy the products or even step foot in the store. Well, he completely changed that. He made jewelry accessible. Um, he made it cool and uh, he, he made a fortune along the way, but he started out with one store and it came from adversity. So his house burnt down. He had worked for his uncle for 25 years. He wrote down on a bit of paper that night that he was going to buy his uncle's business. His uncle said, no, I'm not selling. And so he opened his own store and the rest is history. I mean, it's a half a billion dollar brand in New Zealand, Australia and North America. And I've mentioned Jeremy at Icebreaker. Uh, and you'd have to say that when Jeremy started in 1995, the merino industry was at a real crossroads. When I speak to the growers um, from that industry, it wasn't always as good as it is today. Uh, and in fact, you know, most of them said that it was actually on its knees. Jeremy transformed that industry by taking a product that um, really was undervalued and adding enormous value to it by creating a category called Next to Skin. And so, you know, he, he, he made and got people to wear woolly underwear, which is, I think is astounding. Um, and he sold it for a hundred bucks a piece, which is pretty cool, right? And so he started to create this enormous value in this product and created a brand that, as I said, you know, fast forward 25 years was, was worth $300 million. I'll talk a little bit more about those businesses because both of those businesses over the last two decades faced an enormous amount of change and challenge as well, much like the change and challenge that we face in the meat sector today. This is the shape of Brimworth uh, as it is in the, in the, around the last financial year. So as a brand, uh, we have around 450 employees. Um, we have our revenue split, um, which is around 50-50 between Australia and New Zealand from a geographic perspective. And we distribute through retail partners and also directly to our consumer through our digital uh, e-commerce website. And that's actually the fastest growing part of our business today. Looking at the historic market, well, I tell you what, wool was the golden fleece. I hear stories retold by farmers who used to go around and pick the wool off the, pick the wool off the um, barbed wire because it was worth that much to them. And I can tell you the story couldn't be any more different in the strong um, wool industry today. It's completely the opposite. We've got wool and wool sheds just waiting because no one wants to sell it, because there's no value in it. And so, you know, where it was, uh, was quite a bit different. Brimworth, likewise, back in the uh, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, was the darling of the share market. The share price was hitting around $5. There were dividends being paid, 75% of the profits we're going to the shareholders. And as I say, there was, there was you know, heady times. Um, in fact, during that period, wool was king, as I mentioned, and when it came to carpet, it was everywhere. Wool carpet was the only choice. And wool carpet, if, if you were really successful, even found its way up, not just on the floor, it found its way up the walls, strangely. Um, so. What happened next? Just got the slides out. Right. Nothing lasts forever. And so it was with Bremworth. Uh, what happened? Well, a big competitor came in. And that competitor 
was big oil. And big oil came in with a synthetic carpet. And synthetic carpet was the latest, greatest thing that man had invented. You could pour red, red, red wine on it and it would just fall off. And people thought, wow, that's incredible. And they did an incredible job of marketing the product. They talked to architects and designers and explained how this product was able to be recycled because it was made of plastic and how, how wonderful that was. They talked about how cheap it was. Uh, and, and so when you looked at it compared to wool, all of a sudden, synthetic was starting to look good. The science behind it started to make the product softer and feel more like wool, started to make, make it have more luster, and all of a sudden, the wool industry was, was actually on the back foot. And synthetics took over. Now, meat, you know, you could argue, find it, finds itself in, in the same position with, uh, with plant-based products and, and with, you know, an enormous amount of, I suppose, I wouldn't say propaganda, that would probably be too far, but with, with a movement towards um, or away from farming and away from real food. And, and I mean, I, I was flying on in New Zealand, must have been in 2018 maybe, and, and I got to eat a burger that wasn't even made of meat. It was made of plants and it, it actually sort of almost bled like meat did. So, you know, we've done it. We're, we're amazing, aren't we, us humans? We can, we can do anything. Rightly or wrongly. So when you, when you think about um, the market disruption that Brimworth faced, I can tell you that it was incredibly impactful. In fact, what we decided was we need to get in and do the same thing, so we tried to copy. It didn't work. Uh, we, were, we were unable to keep up with the brands that this was their sole business. But. Nothing lasts forever. And so you fast forward a decade and consumers are waking up to the fact that plastic-based products are a problem. And that plastic doesn't go away, plastic doesn't break down, it only breaks up. And as a result, it pollutes our waterways, our oceans, it gets into our food chain. And so what did it mean for Brimworth? All of a sudden, there was another opportunity that came out of a decade of what was probably just pain. That being this massive opportunity that you see in front of me, uh, or behind me, actually. Um, this is the shape of the carpet business in New Zealand. Um, and in fact, that slice of the pie, which, illust which is green and illustrates the um, slice that carpet takes, or wool carpet, sorry, um, is actually quite a bit smaller. So around 90%, in fact, probably closer to 95% of all uh, soft flooring is synthetic. And it creates a massive problem because it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't go away. But it also creates a big opportunity for Brimworth. And when you're the underdog and you've been fighting for the last decade to... Uh, work out how to try and compete. Um, it came to a point where we just had to make a stand. So we started to look at well, what, what's going on in the business. We, we knew that plastic was becoming a problem and there was a new consumer that was emerging. And, and that new consumer was sort of called uh, LOHAS. So, which stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. And that's the consumer that's interested in all the things that I saw in my hotel last night and the experiences that I had. It's probably in some way or another you, um, depending on the choices that you're making, whether they be in the detergents that you use, the clothes that you choose to wear, skincare products. Bit by bit, we're all starting to, to wake up. And that presents an enormous opportunity. In 2017, Amazon, which is a pretty big company, decided to purchase Whole Foods, 
which was an organic supermarket chain in North America. They spent $16 billion on it. Why'd they do that? I figure it probably was a result of looking at data and that data suggested that there was an enormous amount of energy starting to head towards that particular type of food, that particular type of marketing of food and different products. Now, what do what Lohas look for? Ultimately, the number one thing that we've learned is that they think about themselves and their family's well-being. That's really powerful. Number two, they're interested in brands that care about the planet and that they're demonstrating that by the way in which they're running their business or the choices they're making. And number three, they're interested in transparency. And, and what I found at Icebreaker and, and what I found at, uh, um, at Brimworth is that it's okay to not be perfect. In fact, it's okay to just be beginning because that's all we're doing at Brimworth at the moment, just beginning. But if you can explain that journey and the path that you're on, then you get credit. You get value for that. So it's really important no matter where you are and no matter what place that you find yourselves in now, that don't be afraid to start. Don't be afraid to set out the plan for what the future could look like to go after this consumer. Because over the last five years, I've only seen this category, this consumer grow. And guess what? So have the governments around the world. And so what you're seeing is governments making decisions on our behalf because that's the way they're going to win votes. Because that's really what governments want, right? is to win votes. So like Amazon in 2017 saw that there was an opportunity with this consumer, governments see there's an opportunity with this voter. And I'm not trying to be cynical here, I'm just saying that there's a massive movement towards it. And when we talk back, you know, just going back to that market disruption piece, I can't help but think about the sort of probably mainly men board that would have been sitting around the table when they said, well, the whispers started to emerge that they might be banning plastic bags and how they would have been sitting there laughing, going as if they're going to ban plastic bags and then within six months they were gone. An entire category was taken away. Billions and billions of dollars changed immediately. And out of that disruption emerged a whole new bunch, the, you know, the potato chips, the proper crisp with the compostable bag. Good work. Away they went. And a new opportunity emerges. Disrupt or be disrupted. So Brimworth had a decision to make. As I said, you know, we, 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 we were absolutely getting crushed, to be honest. Sales had been in decline for 10 years. When I think about uh, Michael Hill, the same thing happened there. So Michael Hill had this run for 15, 20 years where they were just winning opening new stores, got up to 300 stores, went to North America, opened in Canada or opened in the US. And then business changed, the 2000 hit, uh, 2008 GFC crisis hit and sales went really pear-shaped. And so they had to reinvent for a more sustainable future. At that stage, Michael Hill's average sale was around $200. When I left, in 2013, the average sale was $2,000. The company had shifted from being focused on you know, lower value silver and gold jewelry to being a diamond bridal expert, to selling more diamond rings over $10,000 than anyone else in Australasia. So they pivoted and changed. And they didn't do it to go cheaper, they did it to go dearer because they realized that that was where the sweet spot was. And as I've said, they've been incredibly successful ever since. Jeremy Moon did the same thing with Icebreaker in 2015. 
we realized that we actually had to create more value in the product. We had to be louder in the market. We had to focus on this consumer. And so we did. And that, as I said, culminated in that incredible sale. But we took the business to 300 million and in sales and you know, over $30 million in profit as a result of moving even further to the premium end of the market. So, we went all in. In July 2020, the board of Brimworth and the CEO at the time announced that we were going 100% wool. We'd looked at all the signs of where the consumer was heading and decided that that was the place that we were going to play. We couldn't compete at the cheap end of the market. We were going all in. Now, what did it mean? It meant dropping around $60 million in revenue to reinvent the business, to rebalance the business, to grow again. Man, that takes courage. And that's the number one reason that I joined Brimworth, because there's a ton of businesses with words on the wall, but not many places actually are prepared to make that type of decision and drop that type of income to then grow again. So, two and a half years later, Brimworth reinvented itself as a premium design and purpose-led soft flooring and furnishings business focused on sustainability and focused on a consumer that's looking for brands like that. Now, not everyone's happy with what we did. So not only did we, did we make that big decision to, to drop the, uh, the synthetics, we actually made it very clear why we were doing it, why we were going good. And so we were very aggressive in extolling the virtues of strong wool. We were very aggressive in showing exactly what goes into synthetic carpet. And our competitors really didn't like it. In fact, on, on my first day at Brimworth, they sued us. Uh, now, just, just as of last week, um, that's changed slightly, and, and, uh, and in fact, they've dropped the damages against us, uh, which is good. We're still going to court, not till September 2023. Um, but, you know, somehow uh, it's believed that, you know, the mining of subterranean carbon and then the byproduct of that being plastic uh, is more sustainable than sheep on hills, eating grass. So we look forward to that. <laughs> we won't shy away from it. And I think that's a challenge that we all have in front of us today, and you all have in front of you, is to make that decision, to be bold, to be courageous, and, and put a line in the sand. And when I read uh, John and Andrew's um, statements in the, in the uh, in the opening, you know, this is nothing new for any of the people that are sitting in front of me today. You've been through so much change, so much adversity. It's not like we've got a bunch of short-term thinkers here. Uh, it's probably like our shareholders, really. You know, we've got a bunch of incredibly loyal shareholders. You know, at, at its worst, the, the brand was at 15 cents a share from $5. That's a tough pill to swallow. The majority of our shareholders have stuck with us and we hope to reward them over the coming years with the dividends that they've been denied and with the value and share price going up as a result of our success. This is a super busy slide, but I just wanted to show it to you so you have an opportunity to see exactly what's, uh, what's going on out there over the last two years. We've spent, to be fair, almost $10 million in uh, marketing to um, talk about why strong wool is awesome. Uh, what I can tell you today is that we'll continue to do that. We're not shying away from that. In fact, we'll continue to spend even more than that over the coming two years. 
um, not only in New Zealand but in Australia and then beyond in North America. But what uh, the research is saying to us is that perceptions are changing. Um, now wool is, is seen as luxurious, it's seen as warm, but it's being also more seen as sustainable, and natural, which is, which is fascinating and great and necessary. And we're also seeing that synthetic is being seen as man-made, which previously, believe it or not, people weren't really sure. They are still not that sure exactly what it's made of. Um, around 25% of people don't. 25% of people don't know. So we'll continue to make that really clear, despite the challenges from our competitors. And competition's good. Competition makes you better. Competition makes you work harder and think. So don't be afraid of competition. It's what sharpens the blade on the future strategy that you employ with whatever choices you you decide to make. The other thing that's happening is that the value perception for wool is increasing and that price is becoming less of a barrier. So we're seeing the, the, the focus on cheap stuff as being less important to the focus on sustainable and quality in particular. Because one thing that Brimworth's had throughout is quality. And I think when I read um, through the introductions you know, and, and just in my journeys around the world, I, I spent a lot of time in Europe uh, and North America with Icebreaker. What I can tell you that we were, you know, the red meat from New Zealand was on the menus of many, many international restaurants that I dined at, and it was a source of enormous pride for me to order a steak or lamb, beef or lamb from New Zealand that was on a menu in Germany or in Great Britain or in Canada or in Portland in North America and the US. So I urge you to consider some of the things that, you know, say Silver Farms is doing, you know, with net zero. And really, you know, I'll be honest, it doesn't really matter where you sit on the whole climate thing and whether you think net zero is ridiculous. It's actually not what we think, it's what the consumers think and it's what governments will do about it. So we have to make sure we remain cognizant of that. This is our purpose, this is Brimworth's purpose, this is, why we, this is why we exist and we define it in three ways, with people, planet and profit. People so that we can obviously make um, choices to try and keep people and what we're finding is that with this purpose and with Brimworth stand going natural, going 100% strong, well, we're attracting a whole new employee, a whole new person to the brand which is incredibly exciting. We're keeping staff for longer, and as, I, as you've already heard and seen, we're attracting more consumers to the brand. The planet, well, um, as George mentioned, you know, I'm, um, I've got five children, all to the one lady, so that's awesome. And, um, you know, I, th I think about what, <laughs> I think about what that means, you know, for, for them, for the future. My youngest is five years old. And I think, gosh, I wonder what the next 50 years are going to look like. And, and really what I, what I was focused on as I hit 50 myself was to think, you know, what would, I, what would they say and what, what will they look back on? And I wanted them to be proud of the, of the part that I'd played in trying to leave the place in a better place. And, and, and that's working with brands that are focused on doing that. And, and the third part of it is profit incredibly important that we make money so it's 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 not good enough just to be sustainable or just to be on a journey to do things a little bit better it's got to pay and it's got to pay because we can't actually make meaningful change unless we generate the profits out of it and i can tell you that that's occurring so there's lots to look forward to having those um having those three p's as our focus when we fo when we focused on the people and the planet, we're starting to generate the profits we need to reinvest in the business and to reinvest in people. So what are we doing? Well, we're committed to a $4.9 million sustainability program. We're committed to finding compostable solutions. So we've just released our first compostable rug 
And you might go, why the hell would you want a rug to be planted in the earth? Well, it's all about end of life. It's incredibly important that your product that you make is able to be returned to earth or to be repaired or to ultimately last longer in our sector, in our industry. And so we've touched on why that doesn't work for synthetics because recycling is a hoax. And we've touched on the fact that we use 100% biodegradable fibre. So the more natural that we can make that product, the better. And ultimately it can be used upcycled for other products, whether it be carpet or rugs again um, through a recycling process, whether it be put into um, insulation, whether it be put into uh, underlay. We have all those choices ahead of us. Or ultimately, when it breaks down completely, and it does break down completely, it's returned to earth. We're focused on reducing waste, re so less energy, less water, higher yields. All of those things increase the profitability of our business, and so we're designing for that. And we're focused on energy efficiency and carbon reduction. I mentioned we're not perfect. We're far from it. We're on a journey. It's important that you tell the story. I say the same thing for you. And then lastly, I want to touch on standards. Uh, standards are important. Consumers care about them. Um, we uh, are aligned with NZFAP. Um, I believe that um, you know, Fat Plus is actually the way to go, and I think New Zealand Inc. needs to decide and, and has an enormously huge opportunity to actually be known and famous for something. We already hear about the fact that our farming is, is more sustainable, but what else can we do? How else can we demonstrate it? And more importantly, how can we market it to the world? Because they're waiting for us and we're the perfect country to do it and they expect it from us. I, um, I, I, I admire what Silver Farms are doing, as I mentioned. I admire what ZQRX is doing from a regenerative perspective and marketing that hard, icebreaker, marketing that. Um, all these things count. They're all putting a line in the sand. They're all saying this is who we are and this is what we stand for and consumers want to know. So sometimes you're ahead, as I said. Um, you've heard the journey for Brimworth. Um, you've heard the journey for some of those other brands that I've worked for. The race is long and we can't win every year. You can't run every quarter. Uh, you can't run every month. But we're here for the long term. So how will you decide? Um, and what will you decide to adapt, to respond and grow? My advice is be bold. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we have uh, some good time available now, guys, for some, some questions of Greg. So if you haven't already, make sure you get hooked up with Slido. I've got a few on the screen here now that I can give to Greg. But if you, if you haven't done it, uh, scan the thing and put your questions in or just give a thumbs up to the ones that are already in there that you like the look of. So I'll kick off now. Uh, Greg, if you were leading the red meat sector from your experience, what is one global trend that we need to pay particular attention to? Carbon. It's like, it's just, it's so huge. And, and you know, you've seen the agenda that's out there. And so what's the point in, in fighting it? You know, like you might as well go with the wave and do what we can. And so, you know, that's where I think, you know, regardless of what your thoughts are on climate change and the impact that we have, again, it's irrelevant. It's a movement that is happening and you know, I feel that you know, New Zealand's in a really good position. Um, I think we need to do a lot of work with carbon accountancy. So I'd be focused on that first and foremost because I don't think the way that we're accounting for carbon is correct. Um, now, I imagine there's maybe some accountants out there, uh, but you know, I think cradle to grave is really important. Yeah, and another question here, which is very much along the same lines and very topical uh, within our sector right at the moment, is how do you address the methane from livestock claims in your sustainability story at Brimworth? 
Yeah, well, it's, it's funny that methane hasn't really come up um, in uh, our industry yet from, from that perspective, but it certainly came up at Icebreaker a lot. So everyone would say, yeah, you're doing a good job, fair enough, but what about the sheep burping? And we're like, oh, please, like, really? You know, we've gone from 70 million sheep to 25 million, carbon's gone up. Is it really the sheep? Is it really the sheep that are the problem on this earth? It's just a fundamental question. So how do we deal with it? Again, I think it just comes down to, you know, have, having, um, <laughs> having the accounting right. And I don't think it's right. I don't know if you're an accountant or not. Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, I hope not. But. Let's, let's change tack a little bit. Probably a really important uh, thing for a lot of people. Did you fix the red wine problem with wool carpet? <laughs> You can get red wine off wool carpet really easy. Just use a little bit of water and a cloth, that's it. It doesn't flow off because it's not plastic. It comes off really simply, okay? It's just not that hard. And remember, carpet isn't sort of vertical like that. So it doesn't matter if you can pour it off. It still sits in synthetic. But anyway. uh, another one here, which is also very topical um, within our sector and has been for the last couple of years and is really um, growing a, a, lot, a lot of following. What opportunities does Bremworth see for regeneratively farmed wool? Uh, there's an enormous opportunity for regeneratively farmed wool because, again, consumers care about it. You can tell incredible stories. They want those stories and you can add value as a result. So do I think you can get a premium if you're doing that? Yes. Uh, do I think you can get a premium if you're net zero? Yes. Um, are we seeing that play out in this industry and are we seeing it play out the other industries I've been in? Yes. So following on, what do you see as the next threat for Brimworth? Wool supply is the number one threat for Brimworth. And it's the threat because at the moment the wool price is not good enough. Um, and so land use is changing. I've got a meeting with um, a, a sort of a, a dozen growers next month, um, probably in, in Wanganui at our plant there where we're going to talk about long-term contracts. Long-term contracts made an enormous uh, difference to, in the merino industry. And in 2017, Icebreaker, we introduced 10-year uh, contracts. You could take them to the bank. And that's what our strong wool industry needs. Uh, so, um, you know, the threat from planting trees or from Wilshire sheep is very real for Brimworth. You know, we've said we're 100% on the strong wool, so we need supply. Um, with the prices as they are at the moment, um, the farmers are caring a little bit less about that wool quality, um, and so it's an enormous problem for us. Um, so we see that as our number one threat. Um, obviously, there's just I just got asked a question last week about foot and mouth. Obviously, that um, is, is in enormous as well. I, I just share with you a, a thing around the price of wool. When I started my farming career 20 years ago, my father said to me, in general terms, the, your, your wool clip should pay for your wage bill. I can certainly tell you now that the seven people that work for, work, work for me wouldn't be happy with the money that I achieve off my wool clip now. Uh, another question here, Greg. You spent 10 million per year on advertising. Was this funded from profits or did you recapitalise and was this for New Zealand only? Uh, so just to clarify, that's over the last two and a half years, that uh, nearly 10 million. Uh, and, you know, to answer the question partly, um, but we, we also, you know, as a result of um, the, you know, really dire position that we were in, we sold one of our biggest assets, which was our plant, um, land and building in, in Papatoto in Auckland for around $24 million. Um, so that's been helping to fund it along with, um, along with some of the um, uh, profits from the business. We had to get share, shareholder approval to do this transformation. Um, it was a big step and I'm you know, so glad that there was a lot of confidence from our board and, and also a lot of ambition from our board and a lot of confidence from the shareholders that we could turn it around and we're well on our way. Another one here, which has been very topical over probably the last sort of five years for our industry. What lessons should the red meat sector learn from wool when it comes to a natural red meat versus the rise of synthetic meat, cellular agriculture? 
It's, it's so funny, you know, like I just see a, a humans just making the same mistake time and time and time again, you know, including myself. <laughs> you know, we, we, we've done this just so often. We, you know, I, I saw an ad from, I think it was the 1980s, and it had this, um, it had these polystyrene cups, polystyrene plate and plastic knife and fork. And it was this ad showing this person eating food and then saying, and at the end, you just throw it away. And everyone was like, woohoo, what a great idea. And here we are saying that it's just a fabulous idea to make meat in a lab. And you sort of say, well, why would you do that? And people are like, well, to feed the world. Well, actually, we've actually got enough. We just need to support it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy conversation, right? Um, but, you know, I think there's value in really just going back to what are the benefits to people from this product? I mean, gosh, how long ago was it that you weren't allowed to eat eggs, butter? You know, those are bad for you. <laughs> it seems like the same thing. We just keep on making the same mistakes. So you have to fight. You've got to compete. You can't just go, oh, well, it'll be all right. Or you have to get in the ring and start to actually show people why this product is awesome. Um, there's a specific one here around carbon, which you thought, said was a big opportunity. Changing the way you account for carbon isn't going to fix the problem. Consumers want to see action. What action are you taking to address carbon? Yep, so um, I don't agree, but um, I, I do understand that, that perspective. Um, consumers do want to see change, and so when I talked about the sustainability program that we're on, we're reducing carbon by around 20 to 30 percent by um, going to electric from gas. Um, we're going to radio frequency dryers in our Wanganui plant. This is costing around $2 million. But, you know, it's, it's a bit perverse, right? And we all know this because whilst we're going to electricity, we're burning coal to fuel that electricity. So, you know, we just have to make sure that we're, you know, we're really transparent with that. And when I talk about carbon accounting, I'm talking about the fact that, you know, a number of New Zealand farms are already net zero, but they don't market that or brand it. And I think Jeff Ross has, you know, done a really great thing. I think, you know, when I, when I saw, what, saw that, I thought, awesome. That's adding value because he knows that that's what consumers want. And when I talk about carbon accounting, it's talking about the fact that it's not fairly done in my mind. And there's plenty of other people who agree. <clears throat> if strong wool is only two dollars per kg, why is wool carpet not cheaper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Well, you know, it depends on how you look at it. Um, you can make wool carpet cheaper because of the fibre. So you can go and make this product overseas, right? We, we can, Brimworth can close down all of its manufacturing and make its carpet for a lot cheaper in Turkey or India. Now, we choose not to. Others don't. Uh, but um, you're right. That, that number will change and will grow, but we actually, um, we're actually sort of at the mercy of some other bigger players. And, and what I mean by that is, because we've got a wool, wool buying business that suffers just the same, right? And we've got wool buyers who go to the, to the, to the growers and to the farmers and say, here's the price I can give you. And it's, it's an awful conversation. It's not great. So we don't want to make it cheaper, to be fair. Um, we want to make it worth more. Um, as we make it worth more, we'll become more profitable. As it's more profitable, we can offer those contracts that I talked about and we can start to do our part to lift the price. But there's big demand from overseas, China and Europe that needs to be rebalanced and needs to start growing again. But that'll only come about from, you know, I believe the New Zealand wool sector um, being aligned on what we stand for. And that's a lot of work that was being done by SWAG previously last year and that's gonna be continuing this, this year. And that's again differentiating New Zealand strong wool from the others, and that's the same with red meat. And once you start to do that, you'll start to see that price rise. I've got no doubt. Cool. And a final question: What are your suggestions for the red meat sector, given what you have done to rebrand and transform? Just go after one thing. 
you know, is probably the way that I would explain it best. Now, there's multiple choices and trade-offs to that, and so you know, having an, an aligned sector is, I think, probably the first primary goal. And then once you've made that decision, um, you know, never stop, and never give up. Um, so the same applies to the strong wool industry. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different players in the industry, and it's important that we go after one thing. And if we do that, then I think we can win. Excellent. Greg, can I just say a big thank you on behalf of us all here uh, for your presentation, and good luck with what you're trying to achieve. As a strong wool grower, all power to your arm, and we, we look forward to some better pricing in the future. <laughs> Thanks very much. And,